Good evening. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, my name is Nirav Doshi. Um, I, am, I work with AWS and I'm a technical account manager. I have here with me Yogesh Pai, who's also a fellow technical account manager. Um, we both work with AWS. Um, we have with us, there's Nitish, excellent, thank you. We have with us Nitish Bugalia from um, my team 11. Nitish heads the product and strategy team. And we also have Arpit Dubey, who's a technical lead at uh, GamesOp. Um, thank you, Nitish. Thank you, Arpit, um, for joining us today. And uh, we're looking forward to having this great discussion about building a scalable game business on the cloud. Thank you so much again for joining us. Um, let's get started. Absolutely. Thank um, you so much, Peter, and thank you so much for being patient while I was struggling with the technology. No problems at no all. Problem. We've all been there. We've we've had our struggles with it yesterday as well. <laughs> all good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, quickly, we are talking about scalable businesses on the cloud. Um, just for the sake of the audience, Nitish, um, are is my team eleven fully on cloud? Yes, it is. It is fully on cloud. We started our cloud journey back in two thousand nineteen. Okay. Uh, and since then, we have been slowly migrating uh, some of the systems, some of the legacy systems. But I think somewhere in the first um, uh, first quarter of 2020, we were able to fully migrate to cloud. And today, all of our applications, in fact, like all of our QA and uh, production workloads run in cloud. Not just for my team 11, but for the other other products as well, like Sports Tiger and Rami nice. and Poker. Very nice. Thank you. Um, similarly, Arpit, games up. Um, does GameStop yeah. run out of the cloud? Yeah, so we were quite lucky enough that we never uh, had a system that was on-premise. So okay. we started out building our product on cloud. So Brilliant. we uh, hopped on from one cloud provider to another to find out the best fit or a provider that could, you know, uh, help us to for our, all the cloud needs. So, hmm. yeah, we tried a bunch of cloud providers, but from the beginning only we were uh, on cloud. That is very nice. Um, this is very interesting. Maybe we'll we'll go a little deeper with you, Nitish. Um, are you able to share your journey so far? How did you like? How was your decision making to migrate to the cloud, and eventually, how did it really execute and come come through? Absolutely. Um, and thank you, Nero, for the question. Like, I, it's it's a very interesting question that I I get asked of, uh, pretty often. Uh, especially from new, new startups as well as like some seasoned startups as well. Um, hmm. So I joined my team 11 in April of 2019, right in hmm. the middle of IPL season, which was which is one of the biggest uh, uh, okay. seasons that we sort of prepare for. Hmm. And uh, one of the first things that I asked my tech team when I had joined was like, why are we not running on cloud? Hmm. And uh, the answer was essentially that uh, since we had developed the application on the legacy platforms and um, nobody thought about like uh, 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 like the challenges that that uh, the legacy platform sort of brought. Uh, mm -hmm. But 2019 IPL, we saw unprecedented growth uh, compared mm -hmm. to 2018. Uh, we grew more mm -hmm. than 50x just in terms wow. of users and workloads alone. And mm -hmm. that is uh, and and uh, fortunately or unfortunately, like there was one incident in a game. I think I still remember the date. Uh, date 19th of April. Uh, sorry, 23rd of April, Sunrisers versus Chennai, uh, high octane game. And uh, typically, what happens is 7:30 is the game start. 7 o'clock mm. is when the toss happens. 7:05 mm. or 7:10 ish is when the notification goes out to the customers. And mm. that's when our application completely went down. Uh, oh. People, uh, yeah, people were stuck. Uh, people were not able to move forward from one page to another. Uh, mm. We got more than 10,000 complaints across uh, social media, email, chat support. Uh, phone calls and the team was completely swamped and um, uh, the, the worst part was nobody had a clue like what what, what actually had happened okay. uh, when upon further digging like 45 fish minutes or so later like the system started to back up again uh, hmm. when we asked our uh, uh, network partners like what had went wrong it took them two days to come back with an answer uh, wow. so for me, that was that was really the breaking point that we can't sustain if we want to become a, a digital company. If we want to become a sustainable, um, a sustainable and scalable platform, like we, then and there, it was decided that we are moving to a cloud. Now the decision mm -hmm. is that 
and like the uh, decision was which crowd and uh, like how much is the ep and like all the other things about, uh, started about so that was the trick point from there onwards nice. all the conversations um, and i think one of the other things that made it the aggressive move very clear was we were title sponsors for the uh, the india's tour to us and the west indies in july in that year and we realized that if we are not able to crack the ipl then um, imagine a scenario where our founders are presenting the trophy to the winning teams and mm. our services are not even responding like that is that is more horrendous so that is that is where right. uh, the decision was very clear that we had to move to the club right no that is a that is interesting and especially in such a um you were obviously you, your operations were impacted at at an at a very important event something which uh, does significantly contribute to even the operations the name the brand as well as revenue yeah. um definitely have you have you had an opportunity to look back at how has that migration to the cloud enabled growth to your business absolutely i think i have said this before as well like uh, uh, once we start once we finished our first transition uh, of uh, shifting our existing infrastructure uh, mm. to the cloud before the july event um, mm. uh, for the very first thing that was immediately clear was the cost savings so mm. earlier say for example we were paying for the top of the line servers that that used to be live for the entire two months duration and then uh, and then hardly be used for 20 minutes a day right? correct Uh, uh, instead of that, like paying as you use uh, with the hourly pricing model, I think that was a significant uh, uh, that was a that was a significant cost savings. And as you say, like every every penny saved is a penny earned. So I think that was that was nominal right from the get go. And then True. later on, we started also realizing uh, the cloud native ecosystem, the power the power that it brought. Like for example, your uh, basic security testing, your WAF layers, your Uh, fraud prevention mechanisms, the ability to uh, to uh, uh, to generate the data as well as store the data in cheaper formats, and then utilize that data to run analytics on that on top of that. I think yeah. those uh, those values are still reaping. The other okay. thing uh, I think that really helped us before moving to the cloud, our typical release cycles would be like for two three weeks. It would take us to do one production release. Um, now we do more than like I think five six production releases per day, uh, which nice. is a significant win because like. for me it's very straightforward uh, the code that is running in the production is the code that mm. is generating value the code that is running in a developer system is not generating any value to the business and uh, uh, not collecting any feedback so i think uh, values have been tremendous we are saving typically um, 60 to 70% just in terms of uh, dollar value alone um, in terms of cloud expenditure our technology footprint is 5x times of what it used to be back in 2019 in terms of the servers in terms of the services that we have in terms of the processes um the database size and all these things um as i already said like we are doing faster and better releases uh, we have better control um and in fact like now developers are not having to worry about uh, whether the service will run or not like they're not having to worry about the scalability of the of the systems they simply mm-hmm. have to focus more on their code and rest everything uh, gets automatically taken care of very nice i really like the way you've you've actually thought it through um it is really important that the agility to to market really um that is the strongest one of the strong usps that customers really reap on the cloud so very nice thank you um similarly arpit is there is there some similar information you can share with us about how has your migration really impacted your business yeah so basically when you start small as a business uh, mm. so you you have a team of developers that are not many in strength so basically you want to focus on making the product rather than uh, worrying about the infrastructure that your product is going to run on correct so i think initially the best way to do that is to have a managed cloud provide have a cloud provider that would manage your infrastructure separately for you so you mm. need not to worry about development uh, deployment cycles testing or mm. storing the data or managing the data and the developers wow. who are obviously initially they would be less in number they can more uh, they can focus more on creating the product and creating value for your company true so when the number of uh, people working for your companies are less it is it becomes very crucial for each person in the team to create some value and if half of their time are spent on 
managing your services and you know collecting analytics data or uh, managing storage then it would be mm-hmm. that would be that would go in big so that's True. why we decided to initially just to be on cloud itself we never thought of going on premise very good and uh, yeah so that's that brilliant thank you cool so uh, nirav uh, just a question now for you right mm-hmm. on the similar lines i think you have been there on both sides of the world in terms of your overall uh, gaming experience so how do you think i think nitish briefly touched this point in terms of scale when it comes to peak events right so if you have an anecdote from you know your previous experience as to how it was back in days in terms of scaling versus how it is now on cloud yeah sure um nitish did for touch and even arpit did point about a few of the benefits um but in comparison i mean from that time to now i mean there has been a major overhaul of infrastructure management um in my first job in 2005 our it team had to rigorously work backwards from our game launch dates um they had to order our servers network devices storage firewalls etc it had to be done well in advance to make sure we we accounted for the timelines that it took to to deliver those devices and the time it takes to set them up test them fix any issues patch anything um we had to set up monitoring alerting you know any failover automation testing had to be performed and stuff it was a lot of work i mean further during the game operations post launch after the game has launched um uh, managing that infrastructure had its own set of challenges at times um later even the it team had to perform some jugglery to find opportunities to repurpose any infrastructure that was not needed in production anymore um like after the game's usage has dropped or if the if the game has uh, has been decommissioned um in my next job around 2011 we already had adopted aws for some of our some of our work like you know user and load testing environments to perform builds and such um there was a much better experience for us back end developers and that is where i really learned about on demand infrastructure um we had better control over the infrastructure and our provisioning was simplified however we were still using the cloud in a somewhat traditional manner uh, with the need of an it team to provision everything we needed we were not exactly a devops org then in my last job uh, the one before aws we were fully cloud native um and my team was a devops team all our games ran out of the cloud ran on aws of course and my engineers were conversant with um with server deployment automating infrastructure operations we we scripted everything that was required i mean we used multiple managed services like arpit touched upon um we used managed services like rds dynamo db redshift that really made our lives easy with that we were less obsessed with rigorous infrastructure planning and management and and we offloaded the undifferentiated heavy lift, undifferentiated heavy lifting to aws we, we then focused only on our games and our players um off late i do want to mention about a number of customers that i see today um who adopt serverless architectures for multiple backend game components um if not all this now has eliminated the need for infrastructure infrastructure management altogether so that's a that's a revolution that's the next level of infrastructure management i see um that's really how i would summarize the the evolution of infrastructure management uh, that i have seen thanks nice thanks thanks nero um arpit there were yeah. um i was recently uh, for this talk um I was reading through some of the media reports and I read about uh, reports about GameZop driving 650 million hours of engagement on MX Player. Um this was data from AppAny. AppAny. Um this is really huge. Um how does GameZop leverage the cloud services to achieve the scale and improve the player experience? Okay. So, Neera just uh, like just you were saying that we basically we do not have any uh, backend services running uh by default for all our services wh- hmm. what we do is basically on, we uh, spin up serverless functions on demand so Great. we have different different more than 100 of micro services run on our uh, basically serverless functions hmm. and what they do is that as soon as the traffic increases or the number of users starts uh, starts to increase hmm. we just spin up more and more servers according to our needs hmm. and those serverless functions have functions for example 
uh, one service can relate to you know storing game data one service mm-hmm. uh, serverless function can relate to processing that score that a uh, user has scored hmm. and one function can basically <clears throat> perform some kind of authentication for that user whether the score that hmm. he scored was valid or not so we basically divided all our components into small small microservices and then we broke hmm. it down into serverless functions and then we deployed Very so nice. before that we were already so before this we were using basically ec2 instances on which our processes were running but hmm. then we found out that okay at night times so all our basically most of our users were from india at that time hmm. so we figured out that okay at night time the machines were already provisioned and they were eating up a lot of resources even though yeah. uh, we weren't required that many resources for less number hmm. of users so hmm. then we moved on to we discovered that okay aws has some uh, fun- service called lambda functions so we Right. moved on to using serverless functions we broke hmm. down our architecture into microservices Very and good. some of some of our front end services also use serverless functions so basically you can serve your complete front end applications uh, to from serverless functions so that is something that we discovered and we leverage that very nice this is very good thank you for that thank you for sharing that cool uh, the next question nitish uh, this is for you right so uh, we see that monetization and engagement are very crucial for every game studio and you know however it it all starts on you know on one point like getting more and more players on the platform so can you tell us about uh, you know my team 11's data journey on aws and how it actually helped to improve uh, player acquisition strategies <clears throat> absolutely so data is something that is uh, very close to my heart and like um, i i uh, um, as part of my role i uh, i sort of look at all the data strategies that we typically build uh, one of the things that we initially used to struggle was uh, like while the company was growing the con- the conversation were mostly on the uh, uh, acquiring more and more users right uh, and the focus was more on the, uh, getting as many people in the door rather than like focusing more on the monetization because the thought process was that if you have more users like monetization will eventually appear which was true to certain yeah. extent but after after a certain time like once the services start maturing once the industry starts maturing hmm. uh, you start facing different challenges where there are uh, hundreds of different game providers like how do you retain your customers and that is where like knowing about your customers like knowing their psyche knowing what they like what they really love and what they don't really like at all like i think those all those things are uh, so important and that is what we have been investing our time and energy on in the past couple of uh, i want to say like uh, more than a year essentially um, nice. so in the past past year or so now uh, <clears throat> we have we have started capturing all the customer information from the behavioral perspective um, mm-hmm. uh, using event based methodologies all those mm-hmm. events are essentially uh, written in uh, written in flat files in uh, in s3 buckets that are stored mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. on top of that like we have our analytical algorithms running to analyze those constantly and then mm-hmm. feeding our real time uh, uh, real time customer scoring engines so for example let's say uh, uh, let's say yogesh and nirav are uh, both my team 11 customers and like mm-hmm. yogesh loves to play head to head contests versus mm-hmm. nirav loves to play say uh, uh, your typical jackpot contests right mm-hmm. um, uh, now when the toss happens uh, the algorithm anal- analyzes that uh, nirav has more high propensity towards playing jackpot contest versus yogesh has high propensity mm-hmm. towards head to head contest uh, since it has mm-hmm. all the information we also analyze like what is the typical monetary value that uh, that yogesh and uh, nirav are, con- uh, uh, are generally playing with mm-hmm. and then we try to play around with the discounting mechanism around those prices like if we are seeing that mm-hmm. nirav has not been participating from the past 7 days then say uh, hey nirav based on your past history like here is something that uh, uh, that might sort of nudge you to participate in the uh, in the contest itself so nice. for example nirav loves to play with 49 rupees uh, in the jackpot contest and in the past 3 4 days he hasn't played then we would we would offer him a, f- a 5 rupees 7 rupee flat discount uh, based on also his wallet amount so like all these information we capture in real time we maintain in real mm. time and then mm. we we make decisions on real time Uh, mm-hmm. where the primary premise of the algorithm is that it is trying to maximize the participation while also not trying to lose us money right so that mm-hmm. at least we are breaking even in our in our in our monetary decisions uh, so that is mm-hmm. where a lot of intelligence is built in and it requires huge amounts of data to be able to make those decisions in real time in split seconds and send it to the customers yeah. uh, so i think Great. 
that is something that we have been working on uh, we hmm. launched it in a beta phase it took us almost one year to develop that uh, hmm. we tested uh, tested it out on uh, uh, on uh, i think one of the uh, recent poker campaigns that we did uh, we hmm. got an roi of 405 times of what we initially spent on that campaign uh wow. now using this uh since poker has limited audience but the hmm. ticket size is typically higher so we wanted to try with that and hmm. it, it, it yielded great results um today okay. if i look at like we have i think more than uh, more, more than 30 to 35 odd algorithms running not just in uh, monetization but also fraud detection uh, fraud Good. prevention um uh, uh, then i think we recently introduced uh, skill based games like games of as well uh, mm. uh, and uh, like there there also it is very very important because the games are just happening in 2 3 minutes so mm. uh, i think fraud detection becomes even more important there because Fine. you have to within 2 3 minutes you have to take the decision and uh, give the winnings to the customer whereas in a cricket match the game lasts for 4 hours so you have more and more time to analyze the data your algorithms can be slightly mm. even less efficient and still yield better results So, like I think, mm. these are the things that we have been doing. Um, these are the areas where we are investing. Uh, we have invested heavily into data lake. Um, mm. now, rather than thinking about the end use cases of the data, uh, we are more thinking in terms of like let's capture all the information. And once we capture, mm. the uses will automatically start appearing if I have the data yeah. and information available uh, uh, with us uh, for those kind of things. So that's that's the philosophy that we are okay. following lately. Nice and. um you you did touch on this um so the data keeps you keep the player engaged in the game and to to constantly use more and more functionality of the system but if there is a new uh, do you also use this to make recommendations where invite your friends or something of that sort which is how it helps you acquire more players absolutely absolutely so like um uh, we have seen like some of our best customers actually come from referrals rather than Correct. our marketing strategies um, uh, because if, if uh, uh, i think it's human tendency if i like something better then i typically tend to advertise it myself to my friends and family mm. um, so that is that is a very important aspect of it as well uh, uh, we, we analyze the customers data we typically compare them to past referral behaviors uh, mm. and we see like people who have higher rate of successful referrals like we we keep on giving them different different sort of uh earning mechanisms or offers um mm. uh, which sort of brings them brings more like minded players on the platform uh, uh mm. to keep the customer acquisition and retention strategies going and it nice um great i i think uh, uh thanks thanks for the insights on the you know capturing of the behavioral data right so it it definitely brings in more and more use cases nitish um uh, yeah. on a similar note uh, arpit uh, if you could let us know about you know how games games of using uh, data in terms of you know uh, yeah. getting better insights yeah okay so yeah so start from the beginning uh, when a user lands on our platform so hmm. first of all what we need to make sure that the user is matched with a person who has who has similar skill on the same game that he is going to play with yeah so what we do is that when when any user starts to play a game we save each of his basically all the data about his where the user has touched the screen what is the rate of score increment that he uh, that he makes on that particular game hmm. so right from what kind of games a user like what amount of money a user invests in a game hmm. and in how much time a user is scoring a certain score so all those data is basically stored in real time in our uh, basically processed by our uh, back end services and is stored hmm. and the ml team basically writes all those uh, algorithms which processes that data uh, cleans the data and basically creates basically trains an r algorithm to do fraud prevention and build hmm. up the recommendation system for users to basically recommend other users that they might they might need to follow a certain user so that in future if a person creates a tournament that mm. uh, he or she might be uh, other user who is following him might be interested in so we are also working on to create you know a kind of small social media circle of users Correct. who are like minded and who want to play games together and who are already okay. familiar with the players who basically do not cheat in the games so mm. when you talk about games based on web there is a huge and vast scope of cheating because mm. you can just open your developer so there is a very low barrier of entry 
to cheat in uh, game, web based games you can just open up your web console you can see the re- network requests that are going and you can mm. play with that so for that rml team writes algorithms that basically looks upon how a user is uh, basically putting the keystrokes in and how his mm. or her score is increasing and based mm. on that and the previous Uh, games that have already been played on the same contest we analyze that data and we mark uh, basically a session as an anomaly in our system and if it mm. uh, is an anomaly then we basically either warn a user block a user or basically invalidate the whole session of the user and in order to store each basically each keystroke all the data the data after it is being cleaned we need we need huge amount of storage and for that mm. we cannot basically it's impossible to do it on on premise yeah so i think moving on to cloud has been a real good benefit for us when we talk about you know migration from on premise to cloud so we cannot mm. basically we cannot think about achieving all this stuff on using legacy system or on premise systems true i i actually really liked your your term there when you said uh, a player invests in a game and that investment yeah. is not always with the with the intent of receiving a return return this is not a gambling i mean we are not gambling here but the return is entertainment the entertainment that you receive um, the kind of thrill that you receive so that definitely is nice thank you for that i i just remembered one anecdote and i will quickly share this um we used a similar tracking mechanism to even troubleshoot our application once and we had identified a, a crash in a level which is when we identified a, like we found a heat map um using one of our tracking tools and that heat map showed that a large number of players were not progressing from one level so a certain level we saw a lot of players getting stuck usually you will always see a heat map which is equally balanced you will you will kind of have a good spread of your players but then we realized there was something going wrong over here and then that helped us before a player reported we were able to identify troubleshoot identify reproduce that issue fix that issue release the game out and then we, then we saw the balance return back quickly so th- definitely it's a very significant uh, piece of troubleshooting that it helps with st- tracking excellent um nitish sorry uh, yogesh yeah so uh, nitish uh, this is a question for you so uh, how would you see uh, you know the fantasy platforms evolve in the near future thank thank you which i think that's a very fascinating question i think now uh, fantasy sports fundamentally are sports engagement platforms as i think we were just coining the term player investment so like um uh, typically <clears throat> we have observed that people who um, who play fantasy sports tend to watch more sports as well so i think there is that component where fantasy sports have the um uh, have uh, sort of all the means uh, uh, to sort of become a full fledged uh, sports application and not just cater to the fantasy side of it so for example like um, uh, in the past 2 3 years alone like we have made so many changes on customers demand like uh, supplying them the information about uh, the live score card the live commentary that is coming coming along with that when when they are following a cricket game uh, then uh, uh, supporting ecosystem in terms of match analysis Uh, statistical analysis of players uh, especially for contest or uh, or matches that are not that uh, uh, say uh, 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 not that popular so hmm. uh, say for example uh, 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 png versus kenya were playing uh, you hmm. you won't know most of those players so like how do you essentially participate in a game like that so like to support hmm. that i think that is where the most of the investment is uh, is going and then there is the social element of it as well like uh, we hmm. see Uh, especially during contests like IPL, but or when India plays a game, uh, we see a lot of a uh, lot more people participating in private contests where they are playing with their friends and family uh, and enjoying the game and like they are engaged on the application for the entire three and a half uh, hours of the game where they are mm. uh, they are not just watching the game they are constantly comparing their scores they are coming they are coming back to the platform they are chatting with each other they are sort of pulling each other's leg as well. and uh, and all that social behavior is very fascinating to see so i think like uh, i anticipate that in the next couple of years fantasy sports essentially uh, have the ability as well as the scale needed to become mm. uh, the sports social platform and uh, fantasy sports will just be uh, just be a monetization sort of scheme for it but the majority of the interaction the engagement will be will be achieved through the sports social uh, side of it 
Excellent. Great. Thank you, Nitish. Um, let me actually take a take a segue. So this goes back into one of Arpit's points as well. But let me actually um, discuss. Let me ask you this, Yogesh. Uh, I mean, we are well versed with game studios. Um, they constantly need to keep building and and improving. They need to constantly keep adding newer exper- experiences for the players. Um, they need to strategize ways to engage and retain the players on their platform. They keep adding new new game modes, newer characters, weapons, promotions, events. Um, if some of this was never considered during game design, it can actually become very challenging to build a functionality that the business wants, but the system is not able to um, support. That can sometimes block or restrict uh, what the game is uh, is able to do for its players, and and the innovation kind of gets choked. What modern system architectures can game developers adopt to enable them to handle such situations and and offer such functionality? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Nero, for the question. This is actually a very important question for game studios today, right? So, who are basically, see, it it um, makes a difference, uh, you know, to make their place or relevance in the industry. So, I probably draw a parallel between game platforms and modern uh, retail portals like Amazon here. And uh, for the use cases where game launches or promotions can be equated, it's very similar to uh, you know, like a Amazon Great Indian Festival that's happening, right? So. These events can generate a massive, massive amount of uh, load on the system and designing, scaling and operating such systems can be really daunting, especially to keep the blast radius very small. Right. Uh, and that's how, you know, you can control the outage. So this is where uh, I think one of the modern architectures like, uh, uh, you know, Arpit mentioned, the microservices based app uh, becomes very crucial. And uh, as you know, Amazon runs hundreds of microservices at any time and they're able to control availability of a feature as required, right? So similarly, I would recommend uh, any game design to use microservices in their architecture to build for Mm. the scale, security, and uh, decoupled game components. Mm. Uh, While, you know, for newer game studios and publishers who are starting the journey on the cloud, it would be Mm. uh, beneficial to consider microservices and containerized architecture to be nimble. But for those, uh, you know, who are ex- existing game studios and operating multiple games, it could be really a difficult decision to re-architect and hence would need to be considered from a system impact and cost benefit standpoint. Hmm. Uh, you know, uh, if they are on premises, the first step would be probably uh, best to, you know, do a full lift and shift as it as is into the cloud, followed hmm. by the re-architecting for optimizing. So... Having said that, right, like uh, once the microservices architecture is adopted, we have seen many of our customers actually uh, operate both stateless and stateful workloads on containers. And Hmm. uh, they have actually optimized scale, controlled costs, and, you know, even reduced operational overheads. Hmm. So, yeah, considering all of these, I think definitely, uh, you know, it's definitely a significant game changer for game studios to be on uh, microservices based architecture. Brilliant. I think we touched on both. We did touch on microservices and um, certain components. You may also want to to um, to use serverless architectures, something that does not need to be um, con- available always, just like RP touched on that as well. Great. Thank you, Yogesh. Um, I'll move over to a question for Arpit now. Um, Arpit Games Up has been predominantly in browser games and uh, browser browser based games html5 um, you must have heard of amazon luna um, um, it's a cloud gaming platform okay um, and uh, with the advent of such cloud gaming services enabling access to a high end uh, interactive video game um, without the need for powerful computers or a console or an expensive console, do you see them as a challenge to GameSop's games? Do you see that gameplay in mobile browsers uh, would evolve and adapt to compete better? Okay, so basically I would divide this whole, basically the whole audience for who consumes games are Hmm. basically divided into two parts. The first part is competitive gamers and the second part is casual gamers. Yeah. So the kind of games that we make are pretty lightweight. So we do keep in mind that, you know, if a person, so currently 
just for an example chrome browser runs on the version 96 which is the latest hmm. uh, version of chrome hmm. but we want to make sure that a person who belongs to tier 3 city or tier 2 city who has a low end device and is running hmm. say chrome version number 60 so right. he she should also be able to play games that we put on our on our platform so keeping that in mind we always optimize our game builds so that it can support a lower browser version so as long as we keep in we keep casual gaming in mind i don't think so that uh, basically uh, streaming games running on a different machine to your browser just as, as a video and taking input and then uh, computing all the logic in the back end would affect casual gamers hmm. as per se but uh, hmm. when you talk about games of triple a scale so for yeah. just for example take an example of gta 5 gta 4 that are yeah. basically story based games yeah that requires high amount of computing power for yeah. those games basically this architecture can be leveraged and when you talk Definitely. about competitive gamers competitive hmm. gamers i don't think so we have basically we have uh, achieved that much of maturity to support competitive gamers uh, on this game streaming uh, business as aws offers so st- uh, google stadia also tried that but i think it didn't work that much for uh, competitive gamers because you need very low very little latency for that hmm. and since okay, competitive gamers are already you know have heavily invested on the systems that they have built so hmm. they might be very reluctant on moving on to uh, a different architecture altogether sure no, i i appreciate your point actually that is correct you have a casual gamer somebody who's who's not as invested as someone who's bought a console or something of mm-hmm. um uh, something that he wants to really um, ex- explore deeper uh, the thought here is if you are able to play a really powerful game which actually gets rendered computed elsewhere and what you are doing is just rendering that game that still brings in more casual players interested to go into uh, you know a triple a genre as well triple a, they, yeah. they may actually start liking those um that's where so understood that that's okay um that makes sense do you do you while we are talking about something on cloud gaming similarly there's there's also we've been hearing a lot about metaverse um where do you see or how do you see browser based games um adapting themselves to a metaverse band band wagon do you also see that uh players who are casual game players will not want to have that kind of a you know a complete what is the right word transitioning between a game to another game to another kind of a different sort of a metaverse a universe of sorts inside yeah for casual gamers basically web based games it it is basically a long road to you know transition between just playing simple games on web to right. a complete different paradigm shift so okay. just for example uh, just let's say just for example you have a game uh, mm. where you log in you have a, basically you have your avatar and you can mm. basically purchase some product inside mm. that game and mm. that order will basically go through amazon and you'll get that product delivered at your home Sure. so that is something that that problem which is metaverse is trying to solve so basically yeah. everything that you do in your daily life can be basically merged into a single game and right. it can be done by integrating various sdk that most of uh, game development uh, companies are already working on so basically mm-hmm. there is a company called xr foundation who has already developed a javascript sdk and an engine that mm-hmm. could support that uh metaverse paradigm on to hmm. the on web hmm. so but yeah but still there is a lot of research uh, research still needs to be done uh when you talk about Agree. integrating uh games uh, web based games into metaverse so yeah, yeah. but uh, are you uh, is games of considering um building an experience between let's say that you have to um two games and mm-hmm. once a player has really mastered a certain game you may want them to to play another casual game do you have a natural transition between games or do you prefer the player to choose um what game they like to play so basically when what we do is uh, when a person so basically what we do is we basically categorize all the number of games that we have 
and if right. a person has a proficiency in a certain kind of game yeah so we do re- recommend them based on our recommendation recommendation system on the mm. number of scores that the user has the right. amount of money that the user has won on that particular yeah. game we do yeah. recommend them a uh, similar kind game. of games nice yeah. and they can uh, so they definitely have the option to move into a different game and can may, can they carry some some winnings from one game to the other game as well yeah so basically our whole platform that mm-hmm. uh, basically a user wallet or a user account is completely decoupled from games perfect so if perfect. you have some money in your wallet and you want to invest that money the amount of money that you have for example uh won from playing game a you can mm. definitely uh you can win those uh, you can win that amount and then you can again invest that amount in some other game so sharing Very of nice. uh wallet is pretty much allowed on our platform across all our products excellent excellent thank you so uh, nitish uh, the next question is actually uh, to you right in the prevailing times so we have seen that while the lockdown has created uh, quite a new opportunities and increased engagement for games uh, has the trend on user engagement or retention continued post lockdown um so that's a good question uh, first of all uh, so i think like let me let me sort of try to break a little bit of misnomer here as well while mm-hmm. casual gaming or all the other kind of games uh, thrive mm-hmm. uh, multifold in, in during the covid induced lockdowns fantasy sports actually suffered a lot because fantasy oh. sports essentially is dependent on the actual sports to happen and there were no actual sports for a good period of 6 7 months right true so uh, for us like essentially we had to start thinking about alternative business models uh, hmm. and that, uh, in order to like keep the business is going in order to like keep the company running as well uh, hmm. so we uh, that that is when we started to pivot from being just a fantasy sports company to becoming more of a gaming organization uh, and we start, uh, the the low, lowest hanging fruit was since we are in the real money gaming sector um, and there is a very close affinity between card games and fantasy sports player mm-hmm. fantasy sports players because of the maturity of the industries uh, mm-hmm. we introduced rummy and poker which sort of sustained us um, for a good part of two, 2020 then when i see the turn i i think like yes uh, you're absolutely right like we have seen similar kind of tractions back when it was in 2019 or 2018 when people were heavily engaged with ipl but uh, 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 the overall numbers uh, i think for fantasy sports are still slightly on the down uh, i hmm. think couple of reasons for being uh, that covid has changed the entire lifestyle of people and have generated have sort of moved them to newer and newer interest many people as arpit was saying also many people who might have just uh, dabbled into casual games before mm. have started to uh, get into uh, more of a uh, amateur gaming to professional gaming side as well uh, mm. and exploring the different options but in general yes now uh, all the ratios are sort of indicating that the industry is coming back to the normal and we are also seeing with the advent of uh, introduction of uh, uh, skill based games with the advent of casual games and the uh, and and the card games uh the uh, the levels are on the similar lines now for hmm. the next 6 to 7 months i think uh, the jury is still out on that one we'll have to see and analyze how the industry behaves uh, hmm. but the signs are very positive uh, uh unfortunately in 2021 also this happened that ipl was suspended uh, suddenly for 5 uh, months which uh, which was sort of unplanned which put a lot of strain on the systems but once again like uh, i think uh, our rami and the card business is thrived in that time um summarizing uh, i think like uh, the business is doing really well these days hmm. it has started to come back to the low levels that it was doing before covid um hmm. with some normally uh, with more sports coming up i think like this is uh, india's very first series that has started today i think hmm. we are getting more and more users and as i said hmm. like making fantasy sports more of a social sports platform uh, hmm. uh, uh, i think these are really good signs for me Nice. Right. Thanks, thanks, Nitish. I think that's a very valid point where you mentioned. You know, that's a common misnomer that you know everything kind of you know uh, grew up like four x or five x yeah. times during the COVID, right? But it's not the case. Not yeah. the case. Honestly, like yeah. I used to get calls from a lot of my friends, and uh, pardon, uh, pardon my language, but they used to say, 
इन दिनों तो बहुत नोट छाप रहे होंगे क्या मस्ती चल रही है सैलरी भी कैसे देंगे तो इट वॉज अ वेरी वियर टाइम बट यस आई एम ग्लैड दट यूर पास Uh, Arpit, do you also do you also have you seen a growth in casual gamers during the lockdown? So yeah. So so yes. So when it as Nitesh already pointed out that for casual mm-hmm. gaming, uh, the lockdown, the pandemic, uh, became basically a way for new users to dabble into you know the area of casual gaming. So nice. even I also when the lockdown happened, I also was getting bored at home and I used to play mm-hmm. Ludo for. Two to three hours with my friend every day. Excellent. So we also saw a lot of boom. Just mm. so basically, we host two fifty games, and on the right. game called Ludo itself, we see huge number of users joining in playing games with their uh, fellow and family friends. So, uh, yeah, for casual gaming, the number of users has uh, increased tremendously, and as offices are reopening, the basically life is coming back on track for people. people still have this option in mind that okay when they get bored they can basically go to any casual gaming website they can start playing games with the uh, basically their friends so hmm. it does just because uh, so basically uh, all the people that were basically uh, stuck at home in the lockdown they had two options hmm. Hmm. one was to basically just get bored the second option hmm. was to watch some tv shows on netflix yeah. but you know as as humans we crave for social interaction with our friends and families mm, yeah, yeah. so that is something that we leveraged because while so basically while playing ludo you can obviously have chat with your family and friends you can pull yeah. each other's legs nice. so that social element worked for us and we yeah. saw a huge number of uh, users that uh, came to our platform and also nice. uh, as we are a gaming aggregator uh, what i would say is that many of the uh basically many of the other uh, uh other companies who are already integrating our games they to hmm. realize that in order to drive engagement they can basically use the real estate that is just laying around on their uh, website or web pages so they hmm. they can integrate games up and leverage them hmm. so it has increased in both the areas the games that we develop has also seen a number of uh a huge number of growth in terms of users and hmm. we have also seen a lot of other players in the market who come to us and ask us for uh, the game integration so that they can also leverage that number of users who have increased during the lockdown hmm. excellent um i'll yogesh you want to um ask that question to nitish yeah sure uh, so nitish uh, like again uh, from the technology standpoint what are the key trends that you see uh, that will be very critical for your business i think analytics uh, comes to my mind like i think uh, uh, as we said like we started understanding uh, uh, about the customer behavior i think investing heavily into that is uh, very important as the gaming industry is getting more and more crowded So not just to stay ahead of the competition, but also to give the best customer experience to your users, and trying to understand like what they really want and at what time they really want, um, uh, I think is hugely important. Uh, and for that, analytics plays a very heavy role, coupled with machine learning and artificial intelligence as well, uh, where most of the jobs are being done by the algorithms itself, mm-hmm. and uh, your teams can focus on developing more and more features. rather mm. than running about or like planning manual campaigns for example like today we run about uh, uh 100 to 120 marketing campaigns on an average day um okay. uh, which, and um, i can't imagine like running those kind of campaigns uh, manually so like that that is where uh, the automation pieces come into place that is where your uh, uh, and then we collect real time feedback as well like if if some particular campaign is not working well then we immediately change the creative behind the scenes or like change the offer behind the scenes and, and do a, a, a another deployment so like automated deployment the ci cd pieces the serverless architecture as arpit and uh, uh, neera were talking about i think is hugely important to optimize your cost uh, 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 then decoupling lot of lot of different systems now for example like uh, we have four different applications uh, mm-hmm. uh, 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 and we offer single sign on to our to our customers so like uh, managing the single sign on without the decoupling was 
was such a huge challenge because then uh, we, were, we were we were we were seeing so many different uh, uh, different variations in uh, in traditional wallets alone that mm. uh, uh, some 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 customer was playing a game in rummy their amount was not deducted from this wallet and so mm. many different transactions which were un, which were needless uh, to say the least so like i think analytics um, machine learning uh, plays a heavy role uh, fraud detection is starting to mature i think like as arpit uh, indicated games are right for people people uh, you typically see fraud rates which are higher than other industries uh, in fact like we see sometimes fraud rates uh, during marquee events uh, mm. uh, even higher than fintechs not the mm. sizes but the numbers the sheer volume, volume. of volume. typically yeah. higher makes um, sense Yeah. So those things, um, I think that is where the technology has to come and play a heavy role, and then mm. making deployments faster with automated testing and all those things. Definitely. Yeah. Great. Uh, Excellent. Great insights. Yeah. Um, so, Nira, we want to go for the next one. Um, you can ask that. Sure. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, uh, from the audience side, we have a lot of uh, small and medium-sized game studio teams. Uh, what will be, you know, one key uh, advice to the early-stage game studios from your side, Nitish? I think <laughs> that's a very tricky question. I would say. I think like uh, my earliest advice is think think always from the scale perspective, hmm. uh, because uh, what happens is like as the scale comes, your problems also magnify. Like yeah. with, with, uh, if your user base is growing 100x, so is your problem as well. Hmm. So uh, even a smaller like one such example was like uh, I think uh, we had a uh, uh, we we wrote a standard procedure for uh, uh, for I think expiring some cash bonuses and like those, and uh, I think it was just uh, rounding off uh, after two uh, I think after one uh, one pesa only. and hmm. uh, uh, what we didn't realize was like after say uh, uh, millions of iteration of that we realized like the the the, the transaction and from the bank account itself to the uh, to the transaction table and the year end audit were not matching and the difference was quite significant so like these these small small things these shortcuts that we typically tend to make are good hmm. for speed to the market but uh, Uh, always keep an eye on like ultimately what is the scale what is the vision that you are developing for uh, what exactly do you see and like prepare for those kind of scenarios uh, create your architectural your tech stack accordingly hmm. irrespective of whether you reach that scale or not hmm. i think that would be my my advice to anybody who is starting leverage leverage i think aws provides a lot of help in terms of architectural review services in terms of uh, coaching the coaching the teams making people aware about like how to use their different services and provision the infrastructure i think they should mm. definitely leverage that uh, which helps them uh, to scale faster and be ready yeah. for when when those those peak traffic uh, essentially hits your application very good point thank you thank you nitish great uh, so nirav uh, on on the similar mm-hmm. note uh, just wanted to uh, ask you a similar question right like what would be mm-hmm. one important piece of advice that you want to give uh, the audience of our game developers publishers something that you know you would have wanted to know early but had to learn the hard way very good thank you thank you for the question um while this answer applies to our games games industry and customers or or studios working in the games industry this is actually something which we've seen across other industries as well um one of the most important piece of advice i give all customers i speak with is to conduct comprehensive performance engineering of their apps and their infrastructure performance engineering is not like many more often performance engineering is is thought about as load and stress testing it is not performance engineering is not just load and stress testing um it involves fine tuning your application and server resources like the cpu memory network disk um the normal practice when in production pain is you will so you will see companies throw infrastructure at every problem that they see let's just throw infrastructure it will be taken care of let's handle it for now let the the peak um reduce and then we will roll back and things of that sort uh while it may work you are incurring extra costs during such production issues so 
most infrastructure say ec2 instances on aws or rds db instances on aws they are set up in a generally optimal way you need to fine tune them further so that you can extract the most out of them as needed by your application this has to be tuned to your application specifically the platform um as an example for multiplayer for a multiplayer game which runs on a you know a game server you need to engineer and fine tune each of your physical servers such that you can pack as many game server instances on it and maximize the number of game sessions per physical server fine tuning the os kernel tweaking os parameters optimizing the database engine parameters tweaking engine parameters storage network routing all of these will make a significant contribution to identify and fix performance issues early and or oh, eventually they call they all contribute into a successful operation and boosts the player experiences um, without you having to overspend and throw infrastructure at um this is actually a, a very it's a favorite it, it's something that i rant about a lot so i can go on this um endlessly but i do see this as a major gap across companies regardless of the industry um regardless of the size the scale but i do see this prevalent in game companies so i would really recommend game companies to also look into and research better about performance engineering and 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 take that as part of their project plans so that's that's something cool. i would suggest thank you quite quite insightful information there nero uh, i think uh, a food for thought for everyone yeah <laughs> indeed let me actually ask you another question then um we we have a minute or two maybe extra uh, we we started a bit late it's okay we can run a minute or two over um nitish and arpit is is that okay if we take another minute or two extra yes yeah, sure yes thank you so much for that um yogesh a question back to you mm-hmm. um ai and ml has seen a great increase like you see a lot of customers asking about ai ml um, and the kind of you know multiple use cases that they are trying to adopt what are some of the common use cases that we see in this space in india and what kind of you know problems difficult problems are game studios trying to solve using ai ml that you've seen a uh, great question nero i think uh, nitish has briefly touched upon uh, quite a yes. few of uh, u- use cases earlier but uh, you know apart from that some of the other use cases probably if i were to call out uh, you know uh, game studios are using A- a- everything from the range of like a generative ai or a, you know voice assistant or you know introducing npcs or you know chatbots and what not right hmm. so but some of the popular use cases are around personalization of course uh, where you hmm. know you want to use the data that has been collected uh, about player and his behavior on the gameplay right and then use that to kind of address back uh, you know what his likings are target those uh, you know ads or you know monetize it using using those that those data elements there uh the next use case probably that comes to my mind is about uh, player profile uh, again using the gameplay data over a period of time you could categorize the players you know as needed by the business and you know that can help you to predict uh, the ltv lifetime value and the churn right hmm. uh and i think uh, nitish has already spoken about fraud detections which is like you know maturing very well in terms of uh, uh, use cases and you know how fast and how Uh, accurately you can predict uh, fraud right or collusion hmm. on the platform hmm. uh, on the uh, quality engineering side again there's that's another interesting use case where you know uh, yeah. the machine learning models can be used for identifying defects uh, automatically ahead of uh, you know your releases right or or the testing cycles for that matter yeah. uh, on the product engineering side it can help you to design your game levels uh, and make it you know more interesting for the uh, users or the game 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 players as actually nice so yeah i think those are some of the common uh, you know uh, use cases that are prevalent currently uh, nirav very nice thank you 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 actually you actually touched upon a bunch of things that uh, definitely we are seeing even in australia we are seeing customers ask for for these features definitely very nice thank you so much for that yogesh sure. um i think we are we are on time um we did have one question from lakshay in the audience and he was wondering if there's a future for multiplayer games um i definitely think lakshay that there is a significant growth that you will see in multiplayer games in fact as arpit also touched upon nitish also did speak about social interaction in the game is really 
really bringing out you know the popularity of games is really dependent on that social interactivity so multiplayer games the ability to play with somebody to to be able to have that social interaction is really important and it will continue so i i definitely see multiplayer games to continue to be popular and and just grow um thanks for that question again um we don't have any other and we are actually about we are on 5 minutes um we've we've used a 5 minutes more um thank you so much nitish and thank you so much arpit again um yogesh you as well It was really wonderful having this chat i i actually did not have i did not I, it was difficult for me to keep track of time through all our discussions and i just realized we were on time a couple of minutes ago but uh, this was really a wonderful discussion and i really hope some some of our game studios benefit out of this discussion um thank you so much again and it was wonderful talking to you all have a wonderful rest of your evening thank you so much it was really thank wonderful. you so much guys yeah. thanks thank you okay Oh